So in the studio today, we have Chin Yun Chen, who's co-founder of Cup Up Academy, a school that's dedicated to teaching self-defense to people of all ages. Yun Chen has been on Forbes 30 Under 30 list, and she's also received the Queen's Young Leaders Award um, from the Queen of England herself. And she was the only Singaporean to actually receive the award in the year 2017. Turning dreams into reality In the lab with the formula in chemistry Your memories spark and motivate And make the industry shake You put the bars in the place I'm talking one One chance at best, yes Hello everyone, I'm Crystal and welcome to the Freedom Founders Podcast where we chat with Asia's CEOs, business leaders and founders about entrepreneurship, success and what freedom means to them Today is our very first show and we're super stoked to have you join us this podcast is really about three things, inspiration, insights, and action. So if you're thinking of starting your own business, we hope that this is a place where you get inspired and excited to take the next step. And in the studio today, we have Chin Yun Chen, who is the co-founder and head trainer at Cup Up Academy, a school that's dedicated to teaching self-defense to people of all ages. So my co-host, Logan. Yep, yeah, hi. And I will be chatting with Yun Chen about the challenges she overcame when building and growing her academy. Thank you. So, <laughs> Yun Chen, for those of uh, our listeners and viewers who haven't met you before, can you give us a quick introduction? Yes, um, so hi, uh, my name is Yun Chen. I am the uh, co-founder and head trainer of Kapap Academy Singapore. Uh, essentially, we are the leading realistic self-defense school in Singapore. And um, you know, currently, we have trained over 50,000 students in our uh, proprietary system, Modern Street Combatives. Um, so I think it's, uh, we, I hope to give you know, um, the viewers, the listeners, you know, a very refreshing look of what um, being in a self-defense industry really means. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to answering any questions you might have. Ooh. So how about like some personal background about yourself, right? So before you even went into martial arts, can we hear a bit about what you went through and why did you start martial arts? Okay, well, I guess it has to go back to me as a, you know, my personal experiences being... Um, who I was prior to learning self-defense. So I was actually a really, really reserved kid, you know, a person lacking a lot of confidence in herself. And um, and it eventually it manifested into me developing anorexia at about 17, 8 years old. And that was quite a dark period for me because I was in um, really bad shape in terms of physically, emotionally, etc. And it got so bad that I was like my lightest at 37 kilograms. So that was really light and really bad mm-hmm. for my health. The doctor told me that, you know, look, if you're going to lose any more weight, just two more kilograms, you know, you're going to die. That's... And, and that, that shocked me back to reality. And I wasn't prepared to die at, what, 18 years old. So as a result, um, I, I, I tried to get back onto my feet. I tried to overcome my anorexic phase. And I did eventually make some form of recovery. But the root cause, which is the lack of self-esteem, all right, um, it's still very much there. So when I chance upon self-defense at about 19 years old, and I met my teacher, mentor, Master Teo Yu Chai, um, he actually taught me all right, to relook at my priorities in life. Up until that point in time, it was very inward looking. I was always looking for my about, you know, I was always looking at how to make myself look better. How can I, you know, change my parents to be accepted by others? But, a re- but after I went into self defense and I realized was a, uh, what Kapapa Kano was all about and uh, what its mission was, I wanted to be part of that mission. And from then onwards, it was all about what I can do to help others. And that Mm. became a priority in my life after that. And um, yeah, it's always been like this for the last 10 years, I would say. So you kind of moved the focus from self-esteem to someone else outwards, right? Exactly. That that to me became a much more meaningful purpose for my life. Mm. So from martial arts to martial arts school, like starting that out, what was the journey? Um, I would say it's actually quite a challenging um, path. Um, Definitely not conventional. And, you know, just a little bit of background for my my own family. You know, I grew up in a very traditional family. All right, so we have got very traditional outlooks and values, etc. And being a girl uh, was just basically a, you can say, a hindrance or obstacle to my career, because my parents didn't believe that the girl should be doing this. You know, a girl should be doing what she should be expected to do. You know, do some feminine stuff in their opinion. All right, get a desk bound job, eventually get married, have kids. That should be what a girl should be doing. You know, but. I didn't, I, I didn't believe in that. You know, I believe in doing what I, I, I believe in. Mm-hmm. And that primarily was to use self-defense to help other people. So when I first you know, told my parents the decision 
of going into self-defense, um, naturally I, I, I was met with very, very strong objections from my family, friends, and basically anybody who was close to me at the time. Um, but my, my teacher gave me a lot of encouragement at the start. And he asked me to ask myself this one question, and that is, how important is this for you? All right? If the answer is that this is, is so important to you, then nothing else really matters, does it? Right? So I asked myself that question. A lot of, I did a little bit of soul searching, and I realized I, I have this one shot right, to, to really live right, for my purpose in life, and I've decided to take that shot. Um, I know it goes against almost everybody else that I know of, but you know, I just want to make sure I give myself that shot. And so I dived into it. You know, it was, it was hard at the start, you know, because you basically felt that you don't have any support. But I think the encouragement from my teacher, the satisfaction I get from seeing my students benefit from the training I've given them, I think all this makes it also much worth the while. Yeah. I think I think when it comes to entrepreneurship, a lot of you know the mindset might be that the barriers are internal, mm-hmm. where you feel like you can't do it. But for many people, maybe the reason why they don't want to start their entrepreneurship journey is also because of that, like you said, social support. You know, they're surrounded yes. by people who are maybe doubting them or telling them yeah, they shouldn't. Yeah, I think it's also like a very Asian thing, mm-hmm. um, even more so. Exactly. Right? Yeah. I mean, what weighs upon a lot of parents' mind is the practicality of it, right? Mm-hmm. How is my child going to support herself financially? You know, and what they don't understand is. And that's, I guess, what we're talking about. It's about social entrepreneurship. Yeah. You know, you can have the best of both worlds. You just got to think about it. You know, you got to find kind a way to get it. it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. True. Mm. Um, so, you know, why you got started in it? And in terms of like following your passion, what has been the biggest drive for you in terms of staying focused and, and pushing ahead with martial arts? Um, I think really is seeing the impact, you know, that I have created for my students, you know. I mean, um, the truth is one of the main motivations about why I do what I do is because I, when I was a student in self-defense, I had the chance to meet with other women who have been assaulted themselves. And, I, and, and when I look and hear the stories, I always constantly ask myself, like, you know, why did they have to go through such a horrible, horrible ordeal? What did they do to deserve it? Mm. And the truth is it wasn't their fault at all. All right, it's just bad timing, bad you know, bad place, what is whatsoever, right? And and then I asked the second question, what can I do to help these people? And so then it became a very natural progression that since I know self defense, then maybe it's better for me to educate and empower women so that number one, if they're if they're not victims in the first place, let's try to stay in that position, they must not try not to become a victim. If they were already victims in the first place, let's try to rebuild their confidence and make sure it doesn't happen again. So that was what I, 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 I found really, really meaningful to help me stay focused. You know? And I've seen changes. I've seen um, you know, some of these women who came to me you know, lacking confidence because of what had happened to them and seeing them blossom into confident individuals who are also helping us to be change makers. They're spreading the word in self-defense of women empowerment. And I think that's so amazing. That's really powerful. Yeah. Would you say that um, the women audience or the target market that you're looking at is one of your key points of differenti- differentiation at Cup Up Academy because I mean there's I think we can agree that there's been a massive mm. shift towards people just going to gyms and, and you know fitness studios and martial arts studios and so on so what sets Cup Up Academy apart is, is this one of the things the women empowerment or yes I think that's one of the main things as well and I think it's our approach I'll talk about it in a very short while but, but it also I guess you know in terms of um, gender ratio you can also say that you know Cup Up Academy is one of the very few schools that has a major uh, has a large proportion of women as their student base. We have got like 90% of our students being women. Wow. I mean, yeah. So if you, t- if you walk to a typical martial arts gym, you will actually see the reverse in terms of gender ratio, right? More yep. men than women. Yep. But I think the key focus, you know, um, of staying focused on the in, in personal empowerment, women empowerment, you know, personal protection, these messages seems to attract and appeal to a lot of women. And I think our delivery has also made it very, very appealing for women. Because this is where I want to touch upon, you know, the unique point that Kapap Academy has. And we have created this thing called the Three Rings of Defense. Mm-hmm. So so in the first ring of defense, we teach our students how to recognize pre-attack cues using psychology, right? Uh, reading these behavior cues, learning how to sense danger, all right? So that's in the first ring of defense, and that is so important. The second ring so of defense... So just knowing your space, being aware, spatial awareness. Correct. And- Picking up this, you know, uh, what do you call that, behavior cues from the person you're dealing with, you know, how can you assess whether this guy may have an ulterior motive or not, you know? Uh, if he offers you a drink, should you accept a drink? 
You know, if the guy asks you for directions, do you trust him? You see, and there are things you can do, all right, to assess that quality in that person. So that is all in the first ring of defense. And I'd just like to interject a bit, right? So, I mean, I used to do martial arts and mm -hmm. also ran an online publication. So when you talk about gender ratio and you also talk about three rings of defense, I think that's a really interesting point because not many dojos will actually go into the psychology of it. Yes, mm -hmm. they would talk about before the, the actual demonstration of the technique, but very rarely do you have like a maybe half an hour session talking about such stuff like that. So I think that's really a very nice differentiation point. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, I, and, and you know, it's interesting to point out that as well because, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of martial arts that also teach on, on things like how to like avoid danger. But, mm. but specifically how, when people talk about situational awareness, they don't really go into specifics as to yep. what do you mean? By situational yeah, awareness. Don't get into trouble. What does that mean? Yes, yeah. what does that mean? Why you what what are the behavioral cues you're looking out for? You mm. see, they don't really talk in the specifics about that, right? Whereas we do. So that's the education part of it. That's part of the education part as well. Okay. Um but also, all right, um the second ring of defense. So, yeah. so say for example you recognize that you are not in a very good situation, how then do you de escalate and get away from danger? Which runs actually quite um, you know, opposite to its I would say towards combat sports, yeah. right? Or martial arts. Because, you know, we, we're, we're never taught to like really like run away from a fight, right? Mm. We're taught to like use our skills to engage in a fight. I mean, that's the whole idea of practicing martial arts, isn't it? Or combat sports for the matter. I mean, I've never seen a wrestler run away from a ring before the fight mm. starts, right? Um, so, so that is where the differentiating factor comes as well. And we're telling people, look, you don't have to fight, right? Mm. You, if you can not fight, isn't it better not to fight? Mm. So the first thing re rings of defense really stresses on the point that it's really, really not necessary to get into a physical fight. It should always be a last resort to get into a physical fight. And I'm really happy to say that a lot of my students who go through our program, they actually stay within these first two rings, right? They know what to do. They have practiced what we have taught them. And because of that, they were able to get away from what was possibly a life-threatening situation. Mm -hmm. All right. So that mental, like that mindset, that, that mental state. Correct. That mental preparation, that mindset was so important for them. And they, and they actually thank us a lot for that, you know. But of course, sometimes things don't, go, don't always go your way, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, if you go past the first ring of defense, of course, we have to talk about the third ring of defense. And that is the physical, you know, part of it. Uh, but at the end of the day, when we teach our physical techniques, it has to be very, very uh, non-reliant on strength. And this is why I don't like some of the things that I have learned as a martial artist as well. Because, mm -hmm. uh, for example, people who do know me, I have got a background in um, wrestling. I've got a background in, in, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as well. And uh, I've been a sports athlete for a number of years. You know, and, and the problem with being in sports martial arts is that they don't always talk about the various factors a person might deal with in a real fight. Things, for example, the fact that your opponent is not going to be the same gender. Mm. nor the same weight class really changes the way you fight, doesn't it? Right? This is the whole point about having something that's realistic because you don't get to choose your opponent in real life. Exactly. You exactly. don't get to choose who you're up against. Correct, correct. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you have to find techniques that work regardless who your opponent might be, bigger, shorter, you know, stronger whatsoever, right? But also at the same time, when they're in that engagement, they also have to learn and access when, you know, where, what is the best possible, um, uh, you know, situation to get away from that fight. You only do what is necessary to get away. Because when things can change really dynamically in, in a real fight, things like multiple attackers, yeah. you might start one to one. Who knows? Maybe the guy has friends mm. that comes in midway, right? Or maybe the guy suddenly pulls out a weapon. It changes the game altogether. So, so I would say, right, the fastest possible time you can get away from a physical fight like this, the better. So the idea is even if you do have to fight, you fight to get away. Yeah. You don't fight to stay in fight mode, you yeah. see? Yeah. And that's what I think should be the, first, the, the three rings of defense, as I call it. Yeah. Um, it sounds like, so obviously there is the whole education part. Um, I know that there's also an element of uh, social enterprise where you're doing outreach programs. Mm -hmm. So can you share a little bit about how you're balancing Cup Up Academy and some of your other outreach programs? You just got back from India. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, sure. So, well, you know, essentially Cup Up Academy is a social enterprise as, you know, for officially recognised by um, RACE, the Singapore uh, government and uh, entity as well. Um, so what Kapap Academy does is that we have this, you can call this like a Robin Hood principle. So we actually provide, you know, training services for obviously people who can pay for it, like, you know, 
uh, government bodies, multinational companies, the public, you know, schools, etc. And so what we do is once we generate the revenue, all right, we, we do have a proportion of that revenue um, being channeled towards social outreach missions. Um, sometimes some of it is done locally. So we do, for example, very uh, subsidized training or free of charge training for shelters, you know, people who need our services but aren't able to to afford such services. Um, and uh, very recently, we actually um, have been looking abroad right, to, to, to channel our services too, and, and particularly India, um, because I've read all about India and its atrocities. Of course, India is a wonderful country, but you know, tied in with that is the conservative, the whole, the attitude, conservative right? attitude towards women, etc. So um, just in April last month, right, um, I, was actually, I went to this state called Bihar, it's actually mm -hmm. the poorest state of India. Mm -hmm. And we work with this organization, this social enterprise called Akan Jyoti Eye Hospital, amazing social enterprise. And uh, what we actually do over there is that we train about 160 girls all right, from the rural villages in, in self-defense. You know? And uh, so, so what we're trying to do is to help give these women all right, some degree of confidence, some degree of skill set. So just in case something bad happens to them, they can actually pull off the skills to save themselves. Right? Um, but you know, talking about this social enterprise, Arkan Jodi, I, I do think they, they do have a very, very good um, mission in, in, in their own right as well. What they're trying to do is two things. They're trying to eradicate blindness right, in that region, in, in that state, Bihar, because one of the leading cause of blindness in that state is cataract, which is really simple to get rid of. right? Um, and the second thing is to elevate the girl's status within the village. Over in Bihar, girls are unfortunately not you know, treated the same way as guys. In fact, they're taught to be inferior as guys. So they're used to that kind of position in society. Exactly. So what they're trying to give these girls is a, is a chance to be educated, a chance to have a career, and in so doing, all right, these girls actually graduate earning a salary that could be way above the average income of a family in Bihar. So what happens is that now the parents look at their daughters and say, hey, she's not just a girl. You know, she is more than just a girl. She's my daughter. She can, she's a sober brain of the family. She, she, she has proven herself to be, you know, if not equal to a guy, maybe even better than a boy. So this, this is like Kappa Up Academy going beyond just that first level of training classes, now they're kind of doing something else, which is preparing that woman to go on and do something after. Exactly. Her. And changing like conservative attitudes about it. I think that's exactly. a very nice point for a social enterprise. Yes. Correct, correct. And you know, by teaching women self-defense over in that state as well, we're also changing the way people view women. Because actually, mm. traditionally, the women there are not supposed to be learning martial arts. They thought that it was also something that only boys can do. Right, it's right. something masculine. You yeah. shouldn't be traditional mindset again. Uh, exactly. So we're changing. We're changing mindsets over there, and you know, really giving them the practical skills. Because unfortunately, um, you know, we can't change everybody's mindset. So if if there is a, a time where maybe some guys might think they can mess around with these girls, I hope that these girls can use what we have taught them to defend Protect themselves. themselves. Yeah. So. Um, you, so you run the classes in Singapore with Cup Up Academy. Do you also run these classes overseas? And how do you then balance? I guess at the end of the day, the question is a social enterprise should be about a purpose, right? Mm -hmm. But how do you then balance that with the realities of having to you know, get a profit? So mm. how, do, how do you juggle the two? Um, so... You know, currently, of course, we have all these, you know, paid training services in Singapore. But, you know, um, given that we're trying to expand regionally, I think we'd also have to look at the regional expansion, not just from a social viewpoint, but also how we can sustain our overseas, you know, regional expansion. And this is where we actually decide to go through a, a licensing model. So we're trying to license out our system, Modern Street Combatives, to interested partners overseas. Somewhat like a franchise? Um, kind of, but at a, at, a, at a fraction of the cost, mm. you see. So as a franchise... More, a franchise model requires a very, very heavy upfront capital investment, right? Mm -hmm. You gotta have the layout, you know, the, the structure, everything, you know, nailed down to the T. Um, and I think, you know, given that we're trying to be a social enterprise and we're trying to give some of these, you know, overseas ventures a chance at entrepreneurship, we don't want to overload them with yep. this huge overhead cost even before they start the business. So I think the licensing model is a balance of both worlds. You know, you can actually give them that chance at being an entrepreneur themselves, right? At the same time also sustaining um, our revenue stream from all these overseas expansion because really okay it ties back down to partnerships as well when we expand regionally we don't necessarily need to invest in 
a lot of this, what they call it, capital outflow. We don't have to invest in an actual training center going by this licensing model, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think the key factor to having this success, successful licensing model is to choose really good, reliable partners for your regional expansion. Yeah, and I think that the alignment of mission and values is also very important, mm -hmm. right? If you choose partners, they're very profit-driven, right, with very little focus on the social uh, mission you know, aspect, they might not really agree with the way your business grows. So I think have, finding the partners with the right values and mission aligned to yours is so important as well. Okay, so that's how that's the balance of purpose and profit, basically. Correct. Um, you know, when we last met, we spoke about, I think you were saying, right, profit is a dirty profit word. Profit is a dirty word. <laughs> Remember that, that part when we talked about it? Yes, yes. You know, it was interesting because I actually thought I had the mindset when I first started out as well. You know, because I've always done things. I always believe in doing things that, you know, mean something to me, you know, and, and that is... Uh, that is my motivation to doing anything in life. It has to mean something to me. So, so when when my teacher told me that we're doing a social enterprise, right? We're running a social enterprise, and therefore we have to make money, right, to sustain our business. I just felt like I had to overcome my own personal barrier as well, because it's like, but how? How? Like it's it's bad. You it's shouldn't bad. be making money. Yeah, <laughs> you know. I mean, you know, we're helping people, right? I mean, but then then we're charging them as well. It doesn't make quite sense, quite a lot of sense but then but then I realized as I matured I realized there's a bigger picture to think about all right like what good is it to to expend all your resources within a year and then you, you can't sustain it beyond that one year yep. right then what good can you do right your so impact stops right there. the impact stops right there so I think sustainability really really is the key word in running a social enterprise you have to balance both profit all right, as well as your social mission, mm -hmm. all right, and and that is something that I guess is a struggle for any social enterprise, okay, and it's also um, uh, the impression and the perception that we have to educate the public as well, because actually we work with a lot of um, companies, you know, who also seem to think that social enterprises do things for free, yeah. right, or they should do things at a very subsidized rate. I, I do think like it also comes from like martial arts industry, yeah, right, a lot of senses or. or um, dojos and dojangs they have that, that same perception people think that they should offer the service for free Correct. and instructors get into that mindset as well Correct. so it's, I think it's not only social enterprise but it's also rampant within there yes yes and, and, and you know and, and, and that's a good point as well so we are also trying to revolutionise the way people see self-defence you see, mm -hmm. so it's it's not just a martial arts. We're trying to add value to this whole self defense industry. That is why our two prong approach is educate and empower, right? Mm -hmm. So traditionally, it's always been the empowerment movement: teach them martial arts, teach mm -hmm. them how to fight, blah blah blah. But that's that's what people already know. What about education? All of a sudden, people see self defense in a new light. Okay, so what, what do you talk about education? So that's where we talk about the three rings of defense as well. The mm -hmm. first two rings is all about the education part. All right? And to top it off, all right, where we also try to add value to our services and, and revolutionize self-defense industry is the addition of technology. All right? And so that's why we're trying to create a personal safety app called Angel Wings. Right, hopefully, we're going to launch, launch this year. And this is a personal safety app that has uh, quite a few features, which I think is, it really makes a lot of sense for people who use it. Things like tracking. So if you go overseas and you find that you know, um, you're worried about your safety, you can actually let your family and friends track where you are. Um, we also have features like pushing out you know, um, safety tips, you know, um, tactics, you know, how to stay safe while you're traveling overseas. These are things that will draw upon our expertise as a, as a self-defense professional. And uh, among other, that, other features that you know, we will obviously, you know, notify our students when the, when the app is launched. Yeah. Okay, so there's also the element of education and connecting with the brand. Even before they go for your class, they can actually use the app. Yes, exactly. And, and you know, that's, that's what we're trying to tell people as well. Self-defense is not just about fighting. The mindset, the education, the knowledge is so important. Okay. Okay, so we were chatting about how you're making this social enterprise a sustainable one. So share with us a little bit about how you are managing things like overhead costs with your partnerships. Um, so, you know, we are very prudent about the way we spend our money. And you know? so therefore, um, even in the local context, we are actually keeping our operations pretty lean. So aside from just, you know, a handful of full-timers, you know, we actually work a lot of times with uh, uh, volunteer instructors. You know, we are really lucky to have a good pool of volunteer instructors because I think the good thing is a lot of volunteer instructors come from our pool of students to begin with. So they already know 
you know, where we're coming from, right? Our social mission, our vision, et cetera. So, you know, um, so they actually believe a lot in us. And so, you know, in their own time, they would say that, you know, I, I really like what you do, you know, and since I've been training with you for a number of years, uh, can I help you to, you know, teach other people? And we're, we're really lucky to have them as well. Of course, we do have freelancers and part-timers that we do hire on a prior basis. So we're also really lucky to have them so that, you know, the, the we don't really have to have them on our payroll as a full-time. But at the same time, we're able to expand our operations in Singapore. Um, depending on them. the project and depending on exactly. What's I think, up. like just a point of curiosity, right? Getting freelancers in. Mm. How do you find freelancers that will align with your cause? The good thing is that you know we we. It's also from our student base. Oh, you know, so okay. we actually we actually got to know them from our student base. So they come to us, they learn from us, and then they realize that they're yeah. students, and then they become instructors. Correct. That's right. Uh-huh. That's right. So it's really important to have that, you know, as a as a first cut. I think. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I yeah. think that's something that all entrepreneurs will face, right? When you're building up your initial team, of course, it's better to build from in house. So Correct. Like you said students, but sure. if you're an entrepreneur, you want to get people who are aligned with your with your mission and vision. Exactly. I think having that mindset, you know, um, the similarities of mindset, so. Important. Yeah. Um, okay, so I have a question around. Okay, let's just put it out there. You are a woman, mm-hmm. um, a young woman who is in the industry of martial arts, which is predominantly it's male dominated. So, what was the biggest barrier for you? Like, for an example, what was the thought that was running through your head when you stepped into a room and had to teach a bunch of guys? Like, what did you feel? How did you overcome that? Okay, trying to think back on my first class like that. <laughs> um, so yes, I I would say the first feeling I got was was I felt really intimidated because you know I was like half their size, you know, um, and you know I I was starting out in self defense as well, so I didn't have a lot of years experience under my belt. Um, but I realized I was there to to teach them something, you know, and and, and the fact that you know I've always been preaching that self defense should be for everybody, regardless of size or strength. You know, I, I guess I should be the person that shows to them that that's precisely why I say, all right, self-defense is not reliant on strength. Let me show you how. So I guess, you know, one thing that I had to do as well is overcome my own personal fears. You know, that's always what I have been trying to do. Overcome my personal fears, go out there, confront them and be a better person. So um, so being a woman in a, in a, in a very male-dominated industry, you know, um, having to deal with... Um, men, um, and unfortunately sometimes their egos, you know, was something, yeah, it was a challenge at the start, but it also made me realise how important it was to have, got, to have good skills. You know, pe- to be that role model and example to other women, right, that if I can do it, so can you. you know, I'm placing myself out there, right, battling it out with all the other men, and, and I'm just an average woman, that's what I always tell people, I'm just an average woman. It's just I dare to confront my fears. I had to go out there and do things that, you know, um, that, you know, I, I guess most women might be afraid to do. Yeah. Right? So face your fears. Face your fears. Yes, yes. And I always tell people that's, that's what I define fearless to be. It's not the absence of fear. All right. It's, the, it's where you, you know what your fears are. All right. And you continue to do what you, 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 you want to do despite those fears. And that is what I want people to do. Be a fearless woman. Don't know whether I want to ask this or not, but <laughs> can you tell us a time where a male student actually challenged you as an instructor? Was there any incidents like that? Because I think it's mm. quite rampant in the martial arts industry as well. Yes, yes. You know, by and large, I would say, you know, I've met with, you know, really incredible guys. I would say, you know, most of them are very humble, you know, but then again, you always have a handful of guys who feel like they have something to prove, right? Mm. So yes, I do have a little bit of that to share. Um, so I have met, you know, uh, male students in my class because they have got background in martial arts. So sometimes it can run into a little bit of a conflict there. See, when I teach a class, I'm not proving I'm better than them. All right? I'm just showing to them that maybe there are ways of defending yourself that maybe you didn't realize. Maybe more efficient, energy efficient ways, you know. Education. Ne- education, it's about education. Right? Um, but unfortunately, you need to, you need you need to convince them at the start, right? And sometimes yep. they're just not there to be convinced. They're there to prove otherwise, right? So I've got stud- students where, and I'm just doing a demonstration, and this is like among a crowd of like 100 plus people, right? And I just randomly chose a guy. I didn't realize, you know, he has got martial art background. So he came up there, and I was just showing something about the use of improvised weapons. And the next thing I knew, he was getting into his martial art stance. And I was like, 
well, so I just need you to really just stand there. I'm not going to hit you. I'm just going to show you where my target points are with my improvised weapon. And he got into his martial arts stance. And I was like, okay, well, let me just try it out. So I said, okay, so I can use my umbrella and hit him on the head or the arms. And I kind of demonstrated it without actually hitting him. But then he went to deflect, and, you know, my, my umbrella with his martial sure, arts his techniques. Own yes. oh, and, and I was like, and I really didn't want to make a scene because I had 100 people looking at me, right? You know, and it was in a company, so I wasn't going to like, you know, make a scene there. So I told the, the guy, so, you know, with all due respect, you know, I, I'm sure you have skills, right? But I'm really here, not here to start a fight with you. I'm just here to show these people how to use an umbrella. That's really all I'm here for. But, you know, I guess maybe this is not the right time. You know, if you, if you, if you like to show me what you know, we can always meet after this class and you can show me what you know, but not now. Right. Catch me outside, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I was like, you know, it's okay, sir. You know, thank you for your time, but uh, let me pick another volunteer. You know, so thankfully done. Yes, thankfully done. done. So just had to get another meal. Uh, meet a volunteer to stand on. So he was much better. He just stood there, and I was able to do what I needed to do, and it was it. That was it. You know, the guy didn't come back though. You know, so, yeah. so I think he realized like standing your ground takes guts, right? Yes. You know, something like that. Yes, I think being professional as well, right? I mean, we, we're mm. we're there to do something, right? I'm there as a speaker. You know, I'm there to share uh, my knowledge. You know, of course, there are people who are receptive to it and some people who are not. It's your choice, you know, but I'm there to do something. And, uh, you know, I, I've promised the company I would do it and make sure I would do it. It's all about that. Yeah. I think like what you said, being professional and standing your ground. Yeah. yeah. It takes yeah. that, but you just got to do it sometimes. Got to do it sometimes, you know. Um, what would you say were so obviously there was the whole stereotype of what a woman should do going into a male dominated industry would you say that there were other barriers that you faced um, when you were becoming co-founder and, and how did you overcome them women mm. or not like what were the barriers you faced as becoming a I think really I think it's a very it's a very um, it's a personal barrier you know as I said you know I had a lot of self doubts you know even before I started self defence right I mean that was the whole idea why I had anorexia and blah 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 um, but you know I always felt like I was not good enough, you see? You know, it's always at the back of my mind, am I good enough to do this, you know? So when I first became a self-defense instructor, who am I, you know? Am I good enough to be a self-defense instructor, a female self-defense instructor, right? So I tackled that, you see? So I tackled my fears one by one, but being a CEO, being a co-founder, right? That was another barrier again I had to cross because all along I always thought I was just an instructor. I was happy doing that, you know, but all of a sudden I had to take charge of a company, right? Lead the company to the next great heights. All of a sudden, new fears again, right? Mm -hmm. You got to manage people, you got to strategize, you got to do marketing, so many things. And, uh, and I remember asking my teacher, you know, and I said, and I asked him this question, I said, why me, right? I mean, I'm sure there's so many like MBA students, you know, people who are so much more qualified than me, right? But why me? And he, he, he said, you're the best person for the job because you believe in what you do, okay? I can easily hire a highly qualified person in marketing, all right, and business strategies. But at the end of the day, okay, it's not a calling for them. It's a job for them. But for you, I know, I know it's in your heart and soul. Because I believe there's so much in it, I know you're going to put your, your whole mind to it. Even if it means you have to work hours just to hone your skills as in leadership, marketing, I know you do it. All right? And I think that's what makes a great leader, right? It's the vision, the focus, oh, yeah, focus. passion, right? Um, and, 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 you know, just his words alone, I said, you know what? You know, because you believe in me, I'll give it a shot. You see? And once again, you know, I refused to let my fears hold me back. So I went all out and I tried to do whatever I needed to do to become that leader, you know. Um, so it, I've made my fair share of mistakes, don't get me wrong. You know, I've made my fair share of mistakes, but I've learned from them as well. You know, I refuse to let my mistakes define me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think it seems like that's the parallel between, I think, martial arts and like doing a business, right? You kind of make your screw ups there and then you learn from it, you kind of get the confidence along the way. Like, would that be a good summation? Yeah, I mean, it's so true. I mean, you know, I, I guess that's also where I get my mentality from because, you know, in self defense, it is a painful process, you mm. know? You make mistakes. You, yeah, yeah, it's literally a painful process. You make mistakes. You you, you pay, you pay for it with injuries, right? And pain. And pain. Yes, yes. But you learn. You become a stronger person, right? Yeah. And you come back each and every time after a self defense session, right? Feeling pain, learning from it, becoming a stronger person. And I think I translate that to, to to my life as well in all other aspects, right? I mean, life is also a process, mm -hmm. right? Of constantly learning. 
And in so doing, you probably have to make mistakes and pay for it as well, you know. But if you learn from them, become a better person. I think another parallel, um, adding adding to your point, is the element of discipline. Mm. So I imagine that with martial arts, you know, you mentioned like spending hours and hours on training, like the whole concept of 10,000 hours, you know, to get skilled at something, right, to become a professional at something. Um, how do you see that drawing discipline from your martial arts and in business? How, how do you draw inspiration from martial arts with your work? I think you kind of nailed it as well. I mean, you know, in, in order to get good in, in martial arts, of course, discipline is one of the key things you have to do. I mean, you got to do things that, you know, you, you wake up tired from your drills last night, you know, your body's aching, you know, you feel exhausted. But there he is. You still got to go and do what you got to do, right? You got to go ahead, do your do your classes, do your drills, etc. You got to battle through all that physical exhaustion and pain, um, and that's discipline, all right? It's waking up in a wee hours in the morning and do that training, even though you hate doing it, right? But doing business is the same thing, isn't it? Right? Yeah. Sometimes you wake up in a day and you feel like, oh my god, you know, I've got all these meetings to attend to. I've got deadlines to rush. You know, I've got the meeting I didn't really want to go for. But guess what? It's all part of life. It's part of doing business, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, you, you, you stay focused on what your goal is, right? Right? That goal is what you gotta achieve. Alright? And no matter how long and how painful this journey is, you never lose sight of that goal. You see. And for me that goal is very simple. All I really want to do is to hopefully empower as many people, right? Educate and empower as many people in this realistic self defense skills and mindset. And you do whatever it takes. I do right? whatever it takes. Yeah. Um, so I have a question about, you know, you mentioned your mentor and your teacher a lot. How important or what is your, what does your social network look like in terms of keeping you focused, you know, like in mm. a work environment, you've got colleagues, but as an entrepreneur, you're kind of doing this on your own. How do you build that community or tribe around you? Mm. I think it all started off with having a good mentor. I think that is very pivotal in, in my growth as an entrepreneur. So, and I would say for any young entrepreneurs, you know, it's always good to have a mentor uh, because they really help to guide you to make, um, to, to avoid common pitfalls in entrepreneurship, right? I mean, there are mistakes that, you know, can be avoided, you know? Things should just make your yeah. journey less painful, mm. right? I mean, so, you know, I, I was lucky to have my mentor, you know, um, right at the start of my career. He guided me through, um, you know, some of my, um, you know, some of the mistakes I could have made, you know, but didn't, fortunately, because he was there to guide me. Um, so, so he was, he was basically my, my, my core um, social network. But as I started to move along and I mixed around with other entrepreneurs, you know, um, young entrepreneurs like myself, Young social entrepreneurs like myself, that makes a difference, huh? right? <laughs> um, you realize you're not alone, right? So sometimes when you talk to your peers, you know, you, you, you realize you're going through the same struggles, right? But balancing profits and, and social good. Um, they do give you some kind of moral and emotional support. And I think that's so important sometimes, you see. So I was also really lucky that, you know, because of my what I do, I've been on several different international platforms. Like I got an award from the Queen of England. So I was part of the Queen's Young Leaders Network. So we have like about 200 young leaders all around the Commonwealth, you know, doing great good for the, for the, for the community and all trying to tackle this whole thing about social entrepreneurship. So we are still constantly in contact on WhatsApp groups, you know, Facebook groups, etc. So I think it helps, you know, um, to just stay connected. To other just staying connected, yes. Yeah. yeah. And and also we give each other motivation and inspirations, right? Because we see them, oh look, you know, look at what he's done, you know, it's so good, you know, if he can do it, I think I can do it too as well, you know. So kinda of like a great. friendly drive over, right? What would you say? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. To stay yeah. to stay ahead, yeah. Yeah. Being motivated totally. by your community and your tribe. <laughs> um so what would you say you've overcome a lot of personal challenges. You've mentioned like um, before you started doing martial arts, you know, getting into the industry, even in the industry, um, and also developing into a CEO and entrepreneur. What would you say has been the superpower that you have developed from all of these experiences? I think would be, I think would be resilience, probably. Because I think resilience, you know, is. It, you see, the never say die spirit is so important, whatever you do, isn't it? You know, and, and given that I have embarked on something so non conventional like self defense, um, coming from my own personal background of having low self esteem and several, several other problems I have, you know, um, staying resilient is so important. You see, I would have never achieved the things I achieved today had I given up halfway, wouldn't it be so? Right? Mm -hmm. So, having resilience mindset, you know, um, 
and actually, it's actually one of the success factors of becoming a, a, an entrepreneur. Yeah, be resilient. being resilient, yeah. so important. Okay, um, so I think we're coming towards the end of our podcast. Sure. What we'd like to do is we'd like to wrap up the show with a little bit of a quick fire round. Okay. So we've just got three questions for you. Sure. Um, if someone is thinking about becoming an entrepreneur but has self-doubt, right? what is one key message that you want to share with them? That's a good point. I would say is, ask yourself this one question, just like I, I asked myself this question, how important is that goal for you? All right? If that is important for you, then you would do it no matter how many self-doubts you have. Mm. Find that goal, stay focused on that goal. And if it helps, find a good mentor. Three things for them. That's pretty good. <laughs> How would how would you overcome self doubt if you were in that situation if you're like unsure about something? Don't think about it, just do it all. Just do <laughs> I mean, it. That's that's what I would do. Right? <laughs> just don't think yeah. about it and just do it because yeah. you need to get it done. Yeah. 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 yeah, sometimes I find that a lot of these things are, are what you made up in your mind. Mm. Right? Sometimes these fears are quite irrational. Mm. And they actually don't really materialize in your real life. Yeah. But it's what's holding you back, right? Yeah. It's the yeah. phantom thing. Yeah. I, I think for me, it's to stay positive because sometimes, I mean, okay, there are a lot of worst case scenarios, but sometimes things can be overcome with a bit of humor. And if you look back, something that seemed very big, you know, at that point in time, mm -hmm. actually it's just a funny story, you know, weeks, days, exactly. or years to come. So, so true. Yeah, yeah. that would be my, my thought. Um, okay, second question. What are your top, so more practical advice, what are your top three tips to staying focused on your goals? Number one, your goal should be something that you love, all right? So don't do something, um, I don't know, I hate to say this, but don't do something just purely for money, mm. right? It has to have a deeper purpose to you. That's going to be what's going to stay, help you stay focused in your hardest moment. Purpose and profit. Correct. <laughs> if money is only your focus, I don't think it's going to, going to keep you on that track for very long because, mm. you know, there'll be other things that are more important in life, right? Okay, so that's one thing. Um... Um, two is, um, I think, having that network. I think that helps you to stay focused as well. Right? Having a network constantly, network of people who matter to you, right? who keeps you on track with what you want to do, even when you don't want to do it. Right? It's like a coach, right? Yeah. So it goes back to having a good mentor as well. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are days where I feel like giving up. I'm like, this is not for me, man. And my mentor is like, get up on your feet and go do it. Right? You've got to have somebody who does yeah. that for you, even on your darkest moments, right? So that's the second thing. Have a good network. And three, all right, I would say take care of yourself. Don't burn out, right? So easy. So easy to burn out. I used to burn out a lot when in my earlier years, and I realized that what's the point? You're doing a marathon. Mm. You're not sprinting, right? You know, I used to sprint a lot. Right, mm. and I realized, well, that's not sustainable for myself as well. Right, you got to take care of yourself. You got to have a good, healthy body to do what you want to do for years to come. Right. So three things. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna add a fourth question, but you finish with the third question. Please. No, you go, you go. I'll ask that last. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes, the last, right? So we were talking about, you know, I, I like to have this topic up. Um, money is a dirty word thing, right? Yeah. So. There's a mentality that a lot of Asians have. So how do you get from the point of having that mentality to the point of profit is actually okay and it will actually help me with my social um, goals? Um, what were things that you actually... What were, yeah, basically, what's the process, the journey of getting there, of changing that mindset? I think really, I think it was a gradual process. It was exposure to the business world that helped me to see you know, that money in itself is a tool it's a means to an end. It's not the end goal. I've seen big companies, for example, right? Because they have got the resources, they're able to fund stuff, right? They're able to fund charities. They're able to fund this and that. And I want to be like that. I want to have. I want to be the person that have the resources to do stuff. So I think it was a gradual process. Exposure, as I said, you know, mm -hmm. meeting these companies and realizing what money can do. Right to help social missions, I think that started to, um, you know, help me to rethink all right my outlook of what profit is. You know, so essentially, I realized that profit is not a dirty word. It is essential, right, to help you to do something great. 
you know, in your opinion. Um, and, and, and actually, that was also what led me to, to start our own fundraiser. So actually, to going to, to India, I realized I can't just go India like that and buy a plane ticket in the first place. Where is the money to buy the plane ticket going to come from, right? Yes, yeah, correct. So we actually started a, crowd, uh, a crowdfunding campaign um, that is actually on our Facebook page and in the top post. Um, sorry, a little bit of shout out here, Kapop Academy Singapore Facebook page. <laughs> uh, go check it out. First post, crowdfunding campaign. Um, so that's going to help sponsor our trips to India. Um, and, and that is why my point is, you know, in the past, I, I probably would have a problem doing that. Because yeah. it's like, I'm asking money from people. That's not very mm. right, you know. But now I got past it. Because I realized, hey, I'm not even going to be able to set from India if I don't have this pot of gold to begin with, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, exactly. So I'm appealing to people that, look, you know, um, we are hands and legs. All right, support us, give us the engine booster, and we'll go there and do our work. All right. Um, so, so, so that is the transitioning phase, I would say. Mm. It's been a journey, I guess, for you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so final question in line with our podcast show, obviously. What is freedom to you? Freedom to me is the ability um, to make choices in your life that makes that 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 is important to you. So, freedom essentially, is the ability to make choices that means something to you, right? And, and, and freedom comes at a price. Mm. Okay? I paid that price, but at the end of it, you know, I realized it's all worth it. All right? So I want people to, to being entrepreneurs, being social entrepreneurs, I realize that I have the freedom to do that. Comes at a price, but I have to do it all over again, even if I had a second choice to do it. Awesome. That's pretty strong. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. I think that wraps up our podcast. Thank you so much for being part of our show. Thank you for having me here. Um, and yeah, we're looking forward to seeing what's next for Cup Up Academy. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. And thank I think you. before we cut off or anything, mm -hmm. so remember to subscribe to us at uh, YouTube and then um, follow us on Facebook, so yeah. Side B. And then look for us um, every two weeks, Freedom yep. Founders. And yes. we're also on Spotify. Yep. Um, yeah. Look out for our podcast. Thanks. So Thank you. like, share, and subscribe. Yeah. Yes. And comment. <laughs> yes. And Kapop Academy Singapore too. Facebook yeah. page. Check Go out like Facebook it. Page. See ya. Done. One. 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 Oh, one shot. Now the future for sure. Let's go. Yeah. I was building on the lecture. Versus coming to.